fruit is the name of a machine. Here's a picture of the machine. Um, I, I talked a little bit yesterday about various other machines that were designed by Navy mathematicians to break Japanese ciphers during World War II. Uh, this is one of the earliest of the machines. The Navy's designation for it is on the left. And fruit is the name that the British gave it. Several copies of the machine were given to the British to use during the war. Uh, I'll repeat a little bit of what I said yesterday. JN25 was the primary Japanese naval cipher during World War II. It's based upon a five-digit code. So common words and phrases in Japanese were replaced by five-digit numbers. Now, codes are typically things broken not by mathematicians, but broken by linguists, people who understand how words and phrases fit together in languages. But to give additional security to this cipher, what the Japanese did is they overlaid it with a system of, ran of random numbers. So for example, if you take a code group that stands for full stop, this one 50418, what they did was they overlaid it with a random number. And the way the overlaying was done is that they added, but they added without carrying. So 8 plus 8 was 6, not 16. You're just adding in columns mod 10. Okay. So as you, you can go from left to right or right to left, but here you're going to get 8, 6, 4, or 8, 6, 7, 5 in 1 rather than 11. And then what was transmitted, of course, was this fault sum. Now when the message was received, the operator who received it then would take that transmitted fault sum, strip off the additive. And they stripped off the additive by doing a fault subtraction. So here, 8 from 6, you have to be thinking 8 from 16, or think subtraction mod 10. They get back the code group, look it up in the book, and they know what it stands for. So this is the beginning of a JN25 message. These are all valid code groups. What the receiving operator, or the sending operator had to do then was he had the code book in which he took out words and phrases and substitutions for them, but there was another book that was a table of random numbers, and there were pages and pages of these random numbers. He selected a starting point. I'm going to select the starting point over here, 51375. It's in row 66, column 52, and notice that the, um, the rows and columns are not numbered in order, neither were the pages. We take the first code group, the first additive, and he, over, he would overlay this by doing a false sum to give him this one. Then the second code group by the next additive, the next code group by the next additive, and so forth, merging them all together to get the transmitted message. Make sense? OK, well, of course, if the sending operator is making the decision where to start the additives, then the receiving operator has to know the same thing. So someplace buried away in the message would be some information that, that tells the receiving operator where to start or where to look for the additives in the code. <coughs> and it was typically called an indicator. And this is a common way to do the indicator. 638 is the page number, 66 is the row number, and 52 is the column number. So the operator knows to go to page 638, row 62, uh, column 50, or row 66, column 52, and then find the additives. Now typically that was buried away somewhere in the message, often as what would look like two code groups. So let's say we're going to put it in blocks three and four. The first block would probably be 63866. Six, six, six. The next block would start five, two, and throw in three digits of junk just to make it look like a complete block. So very early in the process of trying to break these super enciphered codes, or ciphers, what you wanted to do was break the indicator system. So one of the first tasks that the code breakers did was to try to break the indicator system. This is a very simple one to break. There are five messages here. Most of the numbers look random, but in each one, the beginning of the message has some pattern to it. And this is obviously the indicator block. 003 is a page number. Zero is a row number, so this is probably the top row. And this is a column number. If the indicator system is broken, then we know for each of these where the, um, the additives begin, even if we don't know the additives. And we can arrange them vertically in columns 
so that although I might not know what the additive is, I know that all of these were encrypted with the same additive, and all of these were encrypted with the same additive because they're in the, they're aligned in depth. So knowing that, we can use a technique called differencing, and this is one of the most important techniques used by the code breakers. If you grab two of these transmitted code groups out of a column, they've been encrypted by the same additive. So one will be a code group plus an additive, the other will be a code group plus the same additive. So if you take two of the transmitted groups and subtract them, you're going to strip off the additive. Now you're not going to get the underlying code group, or an underlying code group, you're going to get the difference of two of them. Okay, does that make sense? So if you can take two groups out of the column of depth and subtract them, what you get is the difference of two valid code groups. Now this is a letter that's actually quite famous. It was written by Lieutenant Lightweiler, who was at uh, Station Cast in the Philippines. They were attacking JN-25. Now this was written in uh, middle of November 1941, so just prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. And it's often used as evidence by the conspiracy theorists that the Navy was able to break JN-25 prior to the attack. Um, I, I don't believe that, but we'll go into that. There are several things underlined here, and those are underlined in the copy that's in the archives. And this is about half of the first page. It was written to Lieutenant Park, who was in um, Naval Communications in Washington. and. Lightweiler is saying that they, they have a new system of attack. And their system of attack is they take the, they've, they've started to recover code groups. And they take the 400 of them that are the highest frequency, the ones that are showing up most often, and they take their differences. And they've got a table now of differences of 400 high, uh, high frequency code groups. And they says there's 24,000 differences, the numbers don't work, but the, the theory makes sense. So what would happen with this process is, once we've got messages in depth, we take the transmitted groups, we subtract them, we get the difference in code groups. If it turns out they're high frequency code groups, we can go to this table. If we find the difference there, we might find the two code groups that they came from. Does that make sense? It's kind of a shot in the dark, but it seems to work. Written off here on the left-hand side, it says, same as our new technique. Um, apparently that implies that the people in Washington were using the same, same technique of differencing. Also down here, they says, I do not believe we want a new Jeep. Um, it's not the vehicle they're talking about. Jeep was a, another one of the differencing tools that they were using in the Philippines, something that had been uh, invented by Lieutenant, uh, Light, or Lieutenant Park, not by Another thing that helped the code breakers, though, was the fact that since radio communications were so bad at the time, the Japanese had decided to build into JN-25 error detection so that they could tell if they had received a garbled group. It might not be immediately obvious, but every block of five digits of JN-25 is divisible by three. That was their error detection. If it's not divisible by three, then you assume garbled. This is probably not a good idea. If you think of what's happening here, you're trying to encrypt things. You're trying to make them look random. You remove patterns. And that's what encryption is all about. <coughs> take, take the language, remove the patterns so someone can't make any sense of it. On the other hand, error detection means you either have to repeat information or you have to put a pattern into the message. And these things are just butting heads with one another. And putting the error detection in weakens the security. And it seems to have been useless because if you can think that you're the Japanese receiving operator, you, know, you strip off the additive, you get a five digit block, you've got two, th two things you can do. You can try dividing it by three to see if it's a garble, or you can just look it up and see if it's not in the table. I think I'd, I'd take the second one. So is that the true code with the additive? By no, the, 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 the true code is divisible by three. With the additive, that's all masked. You have five digit groups that have the additive on, nothing. But when, if you strip the additive off, it's divisible by three. Excuse me. Yes? In the, in the set of codes, uh, the there, 
like a certain amount of difference between all all code groups? I mean, no. do they all differ in at least one digit or? I mean, in at least a certain number. So that no, they they allow the possibility of any of the five digit numbers to be below a three. So here's how you can put together these two things. Over here in the corner, I've got five blocks. I'm assuming they're in depth. That so we've broken the indicator system, we've been able to put these guys into depth. So that these are all encrypted with the same attitude. They're transmitted groups. I'm going to subtract the first group from all of the others in the column. They call that zeroizing. So I'm going to zeroize by 38898. So that's going to become zero. Everything else in the column is now a difference. And now I'm going to look up all of these differences in the difference tables and see if they appear. Now, I would look up 14954. If I did, it doesn't appear there. Now, actually, the next one I've cheated a little bit because the difference table always, they differenced both ways, and they always took the smaller number. So in, instead of looking up 64378, I would actually look up 46732. I'd look up it's co the complementary number. Right? When they difference, they difference both ways and pick the smaller one, so the table will only be half as large. So in this guy, we would look up 20455. On this one, 14662. But it turns out none of those appeared in the table. So then they zeroize by the next one, by the 42742. They don't have to go back and subtract from the first one because they've already checked that both ways by using the table. And they get these differences. Again, look them up in the table using the right number. Uh, none of those appear. Then they zeroize by this guy. And it turns out this difference does appear in the table. Now, on the top there, we we obtained this difference, 26387, by taking this guy and subtracting that one from it. In the table, it shows that they obtained the difference by taking this guy and subtracting that one from it. So we're thinking now that these are the two underlying code groups. By applying those against the transmitted group, we're, we think now that this is going to be the additive. Does that make sense? So we believe that this column is all, all the groups in there have been encrypted with that same additive. Now, typically, this is like a factory production thing. Once someone detected the additive, then it would go on to a translator who would strip off the additive and try to put the words in place. But let's check and see how this works. From each of these guys, I'm going to subtract the additive. I should get a valid code group. Even if I don't know what the code group stands for, I should get a valid code group. And how would I know if it's valid? Visible by three. Well, so this is 15, 21, 24. That works. 12, 19, 20, 27, that works. 7, 8, 11, 12 works. 9, 10, 18, that works. Uh, 12, 14, 15, that one works also. It turns out that all five of them scan. They're all divisible by three. And it's really unlikely that that would happen by chance. So we probably think this, this is a good attitude. Now, most of the time, you would not get all of them to scan. And the problem is just with radio transmissions. There were lots of garbles. So to get something like this, you would feel really good about it. Most of the time, you would not get them to scan, get them all to scan. And typically, they had some sort of threshold, depending on the depth, how many of them needed to scan, and typically how many of them needed to be high frequency groups. Otherwise, they might ignore the additive and not bother to send it on to a translator. At one point, the translators complained that 70% of the stuff that was sent to them actually didn't work. So they asked people to be more careful about it. My part of the story is Northern Kentucky University is really in Cincinnati, we're across the river from downtown. Um, north of us is Dayton, Ohio. 
And Dayton, Ohio is where the Naval Computing Machine Laboratory was during World War II. They built the machines that broke the Japanese and German ciphers. In late 42, Alan Turing, the famous British, British mathematician, founder of computer science, um, and co-breaker at Bletchley Park, visited the United States and was touring facilities. He went to Dayton, and as he was walking through the lab, he noticed this machine. He said it's a machine for aiding in the recovery of subtractor groups. They were thinking of them as subtractor rather than addition. Uh, he points out that they had a similar machine built for them in 1940, maybe not quite as convenient, he said. But this appears in a report that he sent back to Bletchley Park. Again, there's a picture of the machine. It's not a small machine. The base is about 11 by 7 feet. The back of the machine, the display, is about 20 inches tall. It weighs over 70 pounds. So it's not a very portable thing. On the left-hand side here, you see a bunch of buttons. These correspond to the five-digit code groups to enter them. The numbers go one to nine. There's no zero. If you don't push any button, the default is zero. The display holds 20 numbers. These buttons over here enter into particular rows. So row A is the top, there's a button for A. There's a clear button back here, it does do clear. Minus and plus are actually not minus and plus. Um, this was built by an adding machine company that probably left over buttons that they put in place. We'll talk in a moment about how that guy works. Um, and there's a picture that appears in the instruction now, or drawing from the instruction manual. So, what they would do is they want, this machine was used for that differencing process. Once you've got these groups in columns, in depth, then this was done to be able to strip, to zeroize and to strip additives. So if you wanted to enter a number into, say, row A, you would just enter the five digits here, you push the plus, and it would appear in row A. Now it appears what the plus does is it deals with individual rows. So you would have to enter a number here, indicate the row, and hit plus. The minus key seems to deal with all of the rows simultaneously. So you can add or subtract to all of the rows simultaneously. Now subtraction was actually done by the operator. If you can look at the buttons, those yellow buttons that were on the left actually have two numbers. If you want to add, you would look for the button that said 7, and you'd hit that button and it would rotate 7. If you want to subtract 3, same button, right? Because you want 10, adding 7 and subtracting 3 are the same thing. So you want to remember, if you're going to add, you hit the brown number. If you want to subtract, you hit the key with the red number. So that was all done not by the machine, but by the operator. We want to know whether these numbers scan after we've stripped off additives. Rather than force the operator to think about divisibility by three, what they did was color code the digits. Any, any digit that's divisible by three was in white. Uh, red meant divisible by three remainder one, and blue was congruent to three mod two. And you just sort of barely see the, the colors in, in the background. But, this, for example, has a red field that has a blue field. These guys on top have a white field. And instead of trusting the operator to, to do arithmetic, what they did was just memorize the scanning combinations. You can just quickly look up after you've done this for a while and recognize if a number is divisible by three or not. All white is divisible by three. One red, one blue, and three white. Two red, two blue, and a white. Three blue, and two white. Three red, and two white. One red four blue and a white, one blue and four red and one. And that's what they look for in the machine. Now this is a, uh, one of the messages they use for instruction on the machine. Well, there are actually six messages here. The, the JM25 messages are between the double lines. We've got four columns from the messages. We believe it's in depth. The first column has been pretty much broken, except there appears to be a garble down here in five, so we don't, we don't have this one. If we add that up, it's, it adds to 14. Um, we know nothing about the second column. Column three, we're missing the last block, and the fourth column seems completely filled in. 
So of course what the translators are going to do is when we think we've got a code group to go in there, if they know the code group, then they're going to be able to put in the word or phrase and try to complete the message. Or if they don't know the code group, but believe it's a covered, recovered code group, they can try to think of what happened or what the message is associated with and see if they can associate that code group with a word or a phrase. So that's what fruit was used for. I took the, the six five-digit numbers that appear in column two and entered them into the machine. And that's the way the operator would see them. The first thing we would do is zeroize by A. I'm going to subtract A from everything in that column, and we get something like this. Now, these are potential differences. So those are all going to be looked up in the difference table. Actually, there are more of them here than I would expect, but maybe just for the exercise. So the first difference, 31048, it does actually appear in the difference table. And it suggests to us that the that A should be 26349. So I put it back in. I wrote add that back into everything. It changes all of these guys. And now what's the next step, step to check? Zero. No, not yet. <coughs> check the smaller one. No. What? Yeah, see whether they scan, right? See whether these are now all divisible by three. I've, I've stripped off the first one to find differences. I think I found what A is, so I put that back in and changed all of these numbers. I added A to every one of them. All of these guys should now scan, or most of them. Well, A scans. That's a good combination. B scans. That's a good combination. D does not. Uh, e scans. H does not, J scans, and the rest of them is just sort of leftover stuff. So of the six, four of them scan and two don't. Um, that's pretty iffy. That's pretty iffy. That could happen fairly often by chance. But typically there were rules to determine whether this looked like a good setup and the additive should be given to the, to the translators. What would the additive be? We'll go back to the previous one. If this happened to be a good group, what, or a good scan, what, uh, what would the additive be? There's a bunch of things that have been going on, but how about a guess? Almost, yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're actually accidentally correct. It's actually this, uh, it would actually be 2747. But anyway, it doesn't work. Um, and if you, if you take the code groups that correspond to that, they don't fit into the message. There are other possibilities. And we could try all of these as potential code groups for A, and actually none of them work. So we kind of lose out on that. And then we zeroize by B. So we subtract B from everything. Uh, we go and it actually turns out that this guy is in the difference table and suggests B should be 89172. So rotate that back, add B back in. And again, now I'm going to look at, at whether these guys scan or not. The first one scans. The second one scans. D scans. E scans. H does not. And this guy does scan. So I've got one that's potentially a garble. That's not too bad. And if you think about our initial situation, that first column also had a garble down in spot five. So that the fact that the group just before this is also garbled, um, so I'm probably going to guess that, that this is correct. And what should the additive be? Yeah, 9568. Okay. Uh, I mentioned yesterday one of the joys of doing this has been working at a long distance with Edward Simpson. Uh, Simpson is a British statistician. He worked at Bletchley Park during World War II. He's 93 years old now, but he broke JN25 ciphers. And he used, the, well, he didn't actually use the machine, perhaps, but he remembers the machine being there. He said they, they called them fruit machines. 
they prove to have mechanical failure quite often and they eventually just gave up on using it. And I think you can see that when you start doing this by hand, it's actually pretty quick to do it. The arithmetic is not that hard. But it explains why fruit. Uh, apparently fruit is the, the name that British attach to slot machines because fruits, fruit appear as symbols on the slot machines. So they called it fruit because they thought it looked like a slot machine. And this was confirmed to me several months ago when a British friend was around and I had a picture of the machine and I said I was interested in this machine and it was a code breaking machine. And he said, well, that looks just like a fruit. So apparently the word is, is still in use. Uh, Colin Burke, who's the, who is a historian of technology, pointed out that these machines were probably designed, well, probably designed in, in late 1941 but based on an early technology, they just add and subtract. You know, this, this is a, uh, it looks like an adding machine. It was built by an adding machine company. Earlier in the spring, the people at the Cryptologic Museum down at Fort Lee brought one of these things out of their NSA warehouse. And we opened it up, and I don't think it had been opened up since the Second World War, but they allowed us to pull the cover off and things like that. You can see this, it's, it's all gears. There is a small electronic motor over on this side that drives those gears. This is really old technology. Uh, Howard Campaign was one of the naval mathematicians during uh, World War II. He later went on to be director of research at NSA. And he pointed out the machine also, and, and also that they were not too successful with the machine. Uh, so the machine I had in the picture just a moment ago is at NSA. The, there is another one, the first pictures you saw are at the uh, Wenger Command Display down in Pensacola at Corey Station. So they've got a machine down there also. I've tried to track a little bit, but not too much, the evolution of the machines. Uh, documents in the archives indicate that there were probably three machines, one invented by Park, used in 1941, and that's the Jeep apparently various versions. Another machine by Lieutenant Shin um, in 1942, I don't see that occurring in sort of the war diaries when they were breaking this stuff, but they have a machine called Matthew that's being used at the same time. It might, might well be the same machine. Particularly, uh, there's an indication that the NCR machine was the successor to Matthew, and then the NCR machine in 1943. Um, in the NSA Museum, this is what they have for the park machine. It's obviously a handmade machine, but obviously designed to break five-digit additive ciphers. Uh, the tag on it says exactly this, so I don't know any more about it than that. But it gives us some clue of what, what Park had in mind. Also in the museum is this differencing machine. Uh, with a date of 1943 on it. This was used by the U.S. Army in the, um, in the South Pacific. Apparently what you would do is you would hold on to this knob and then you would turn these dials until the number, correct numbers are facing up front. So they're, they could have a depth of 10, five digit numbers. And there's a top on it like that. So you just see the five digit numbers coming through. And like an old foosball machine, you just turn left and right to add and subtract the digits. After the war, uh, the TICOM committee, the Target Information Committee, went to Germany and the cryptologists in interviewed the German cryptologists and they drew for them a machine that they had used to break five digit editor ciphers. It looked just like this, which looks a whole lot like the Army machine, except the depth is really, really long, it's the depth of 30 here. Um, various guesses as to what they would use it for. Many countries actually use four or five digit additive ciphers, but the Soviets were using them, so I think most likely they were using them against Soviet ciphers. Um, one plug for the local area, I guess. The, the laboratory in which Alan Turing saw the fruit machine was operated by Joe Desch. He was the person who was directing the Naval Computing Machine Laboratory um, at National Cash Register. Uh, the Navy commander that was a lieutenant commander, um, Ralph Meter, he was from Bureau of Ships. 
and the two of them directed the Naval Computing Machine Laboratory there. Desch and his team engineered the U.S. Navy cryptologic bomb, which broke Enigma, and various machines to break Japanese ciphers. And last year, uh, Desch was inducted into NSA's Hall of Honor for the work he did during World War II. I guess that's it.